right, the Spanish-American War. In 1898, the United States went to war to help Cuba win its independence from Spain. Now, by the end of the 19th century, Spain, once the most powerful colonial nation on earth, had lost most of its colonies. It retained only the Philippines and the island of Guam in the Pacific, a few outposts in Africa, and the Caribbean islands of Cuba and Puerto Rico in the Americas. U.S. involvement in Latin America and Asia increased greatly as a result of this war and actually continues to this day. Now, as we look at the Spanish-American War, realizing that this really starts with uh, Cubans, uh, Cuban rebels uh, acting up against and fighting against Spain. Now, why did Americans have a strong economic interest in Cuba? Well, the U.S. has had an interest in, in Cuba for quite some time, even the early, the early 1800s, uh, mostly because it simply lies so close to Florida, 90 miles south of Florida. The United States several times had tried to get Spain to sell Cuba to the Americans, but Spain was not for it at all. Uh, but American interest in Cuba continued. In, in 1886, the Cuban people did force uh, the Spanish government to finally abolish slavery. And as a result of that, American capitalists quickly began investing millions of dollars in large sugarcane plantations on that island and became massive investors uh, in, in the Cuban economy. <clears throat> Why did some Americans support Spanish control of Cuba while others sympathized with, with rebels? Well, the, the Cuban Revolution really began in 1895. Um, organized Cubans uh, resisted Spain by using an active guerrilla war campaign uh, deliberately destroying property, especially targeting American-owned properties such as sugar mills and plantations. Uh, their, their purpose for that was really to try to uh, get or provoke the U.S. to intervene, in other words, help the rebels uh, free Cuba. The public opinion in the United States was, was split in this regard. Business people, of course, wanted the government to step in and support Spain in order to protect their investment uh, that was being destroyed by Cuban rebels, where other Americans uh, kind of looked at that, their cry for freedom, very similar to that of Patrick Henry's cry, give me liberty or give me death. Well, as issues with those Cuban rebels and the Spanish army begin to uh, intensify, war fever uh, in America literally starts to escalate. And so we'll look at the question, how did the Spanish react to the uprising in Cuba? In 1896, Spain responds by not only sending troops, but they also send kind of a famed general, General Weiler, to Cuba to restore order. Weiler will try to crush the rebellion by, rather than going after the rebels, he'll, he'll herd the Cuban citizens uh, into uh, barbed wire, you might say, concentration camps uh, where these civilians then could not give aid to the rebels. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as you look at concentration camps uh, in World War II uh, with the Nazis towards the, the Jews, uh, these were not very healthy places to live. And as a result, many of these citizens are gonna, are gonna die by the thousands. Um, so not, not a really good situation there. Here's a picture of General Weiler. Well, how does the United States um, start to gain this animosity towards Spain? And, and this is kind of an interesting story. First of all, newspapers um, 
are, are going to really get into a battle here for circulation, mostly between the American newspaper tycoons, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Um, and what they'll do is they'll have their um, journalists write up these exaggerated accounts of brutality uh, to really deepen America's sympathy for those rebels. Uh, we call this sensational style of writing yellow journalism, a uh, style of news to kind of lure and engage the readers. Another situation that causes some animosity towards um, of America towards Spain is in what's known as the DeLome letter. When President William McKinley took office in 1897, the demands for American intervention in Cuba were really on the rise. And of course, McKinley, even though he fought in, in the Civil War, he really didn't want war. Uh, so he really tried diplomatic means to try to resolve this crisis. But in February of 1898, the New York Journal will publish a private letter written by um, the Spanish minister to the United States, Deputy DeLome. The DeLome letter, in short, criticized President McKinley, calling him weak, among, among other things. And so it was a rather insulting letter. Um, Americans, how did they feel about that? Well, Americans were extremely angry of this insult to their president. And again, McKinley and the Spanish government were literally locked in negotiations uh, to improve conditions. And, and even what, what the newspapers didn't report is that Spain had already pulled Weiler out of there and they promised to have a, a little bit more freedom of government uh, for the Cuban uh, people. Uh, but again, that kind of gets hidden behind the, the, the story to lure people uh, into this, this exaggerated account. And then the, the third thing that happens is that the, the U.S. Maine, uh, it's, a, it's a battleship, a United States battleship, blows up in the harbor of Havana. Uh, February 15th, 1898. Uh, you're going to have 260 Americans killed here, of which they're all buried at Arlington. Uh, at the time, no one really knew who blew it up. Um, and, of course, the American newspapers blamed Spain. And, of course, that definitely outrages Americans for, uh, for, for McKinley to declare war on Spain. Um, it's ordered to Havana not to provoke war. It was ordered to Havana to help get citizens out uh, because the, the situation in Spain was getting bad and to also protect American property if necessary. Um, interestingly, um, investigators have taken a look at this wreckage and have uh, come to the conclusion that it actually blew up from inside out. So it really wasn't Spain's fault. Here we'll take a, a couple, a look at a couple of pictures here. That's that's a picture of the USS Maine. Obviously, that's a an after shot. Uh, the wreckage is pretty pretty intense. Um, picture from the previous page, actually, too. You can get an idea of how bad this was and why you had some 260 Americans killed in this sailors. Uh, this is at Arlington National Cemetery, where these men will all be laid to rest. And this is, if you've ever been to Arlington National Cemetery, you've probably seen those grave sites. Um, if not, maybe you remember that. That, of course, is the mast to the USS Maine. You can get an idea of how big that is when you see the people uh, walking there. And uh, this is kind of stationed behind the changing of the guard area of Arlington National Cemetery. So. And so pretty much as a result of the explosion, <clears throat> excuse me, explosion of the main, uh, war with Spain erupts. And kind of the, the big call, kind of like, remember the Alamo? Well, people are going to kind of use, remember the main. 
And so we take a look at and think, well, this, the Spanish-American War was fought in just Cuba. That's, that's not true. It was fought in many areas. Uh, the Philippines, for instance, Commodore Dewey uh, is going to destroy the Spanish fleet. Every ship in the fleet in Manila Harbor, um, he gets his call actually from an order given by um, Teddy Roosevelt when he was an assistant secretary to the, to the, uh, the Navy. Um, and so he's going to take his fleet from Hong Kong and actually head to uh, the Philippines, where he, again, will destroy their fleet. Uh, interestingly, he, he actually can't. He's kind of ahead of the game there. Uh, the soldiers that were supposed to give him support hadn't gotten there yet. And so kind of an interesting little um, stare down between the United States and Germany navies happen right there, too. But uh, when they finally do land... Uh, the uh, the Americans will have the support of the Filipinos who who also want their freedom from Spain, uh, and they're joined by a Filipino rebel uh, by the name of Emilio Aguinaldo. Uh, Dewey actually brought him along with him. He was actually exiled in in China, and so he brings him along, thinking that he'll be able to rile up the Filipinos to help the Americans against Spain, which does happen. It's also fought in the Caribbean. Uh, which is where the, um, Cuba is. Uh, their commander of another American fleet, Admiral Sampson, will basically uh, seal up the Spanish fleet in, in the harbor of Santiago. And there he too will um, completely destroy uh, the Spanish fleet. Uh, and, and really, uh, the Spanish fleet was, was really no match uh, for the uh, American Navy there. And a couple of things about the, the, the Spanish-American War with regards to how was America to, how was our military versus how was Spain's military? Well, both were pretty unorganized, uh, but it, it will show that our naval buildup prior to this uh, really showed a, a naval superiority out there. Um, but interestingly, of course, after wars, the United States usually shrinks its military uh, and so our land force is really going to be the the situation that's kind of hurting here uh, one we're poorly supplied uh, we're going to be fighting in, in uh, tropical rainforest type settings and they're going to be wearing wool uh, uniforms they're also being led by a lot of old civil war leaders who really are at a, a, a point in their life where they'd rather maybe talk about their heroics once upon a time than lead men into war uh, and it was primarily a volunteer force uh, this is a situation too in the caribbean where you'll get teddy roosevelt who will uh, volunteer and lead uh, the famed rough riders um, in the spanish-american war this really isn't a very long war uh, it's one of the shorter wars in american history and again, its, it's uh, end will come at the Treaty of Paris. And it, really, there is no surrender here. This is, a, this is ended with an armistice. And so in August 1898, both sides signed an armistice. And in this armistice, Spain will free Cuba. Uh, and because the United States military goes, fought the Spanish in Guam and in Puerto Rico, those also get handed over to the United States. And so that's where we gain Puerto Rico and, and Guam. Um, the problem is that uh, the Philippines, the, 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 the battle in the Philippines was still going on when the armistice is settled. And as a result, that's not really on the table for Spain to really hand over to the United States. And so what ends up happening is that uh, this is where you get in that battle between imperialists, people that want an empire in the United States, and anti-imperialists, people who don't want that. Uh, and so this becomes a real battle in Congress, but eventually what happens is that the United States uh, buys the Philippines from Spain for $20 million. Um, you know, the, the big question was, did we have a right to annex the Philippines? Would we give the Philippines uh, citizenship? Uh, what, what would we do? There, in fact, there were even, there were even uh, another big concern was racial issues. 
Um, this, this was another race in the Philippines, and now we were going to make them a part or annex them to the United States. Uh, we still hadn't settled our own civil rights issues in the United States during this time period. Annex were extremely segregated, and, uh, and this, this, this just kind of added to that. And so you, this is part of that argument between imperialists and anti-imperialists. Uh, and of course, labor gets involved in this too, especially labor unions. As they they are they actually argue against this for fear that now Filipinos will then immigrate to the United States and of course take some of those unskilled low paying jobs from Americans and so that becomes kind of again another major issue in this this whole what do we do with uh, the Philippines uh, we'll talk more about uh, why we free Cuba uh, in another section um, so. We'll end that at this point.